and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this morning, our gospel opens up with a bit of a provocative statement. Catches our attention right away. I have much to tell you, but you cannot yet bear it. Can't bear it at this time. So much I want to tell you, but you're not ready. What an odd thing to say. I mean, even for Jesus, <laughs> you know, who says a lot of odd things to his disciples and they think to themselves, I'm sure, what's he talking about? Of course, we know he says that they think that because they say that a lot, even in this particular passage. It's forever confusing with stories making our brows crumple up and furl with his statements. But for perspective, this is not just out of the blue. This happens to be Thursday night. He's gathered with his disciples in the upper room when he says this. I have a lot to tell you, but you're not ready for it yet. There's things that are about to take place, things that are going to happen that will help make you ready, but you're not ready yet. Of course, he doesn't tell them this. <coughs> They've just celebrated the Passover. They've got enough to think about. Well, Jesus has changed the words of the Passover and made them forever a different covenant for us. A covenant in his body and his blood. One of those things that made their heads furled spin around and think, what is he talking about? Now Jesus is sharing his last words with his disciples. Soon this evening, Judas will betray him with a kiss. He's now only this little while. This, these short few minutes reclining at the table with his friends. These men and a few women who had been with him now for three years in a kind of intense theological training session. Three years walking up and down the land, listening to sermons, watching the acts of Jesus. Three years of on-the-job training with Jesus himself. What a seminary that would have been. What more does Jesus have to say that in three years he can't have said already? They've been there through all the sermons. They were there at the Sermon on the Mount, maybe one of the greatest sermons ever. The exchanges with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were there and eyewitnesses of the lame walking the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, the demon-possessed cured, and most recently, Lazarus raised from the dead. Not even to mention the water that was changed into wine, the feeding of the 5,000, the miraculous catch of fish, walking on water, the calming of the winds and the waves, what an education they've had. So much more I have to tell you. But you're not ready for it. What more did Jesus need to convey? What more did they have to learn? They were graduates from the first and the finest seminary in the world. What if the disciples ended everything right there? What if in their fear after the crucifixion, they had all run away, went home, went back to their jobs, 
forgot about this Jesus. <clears throat> Didn't do what he said. Stay here until you are endued with power from on high. What if they didn't do that? What if they had abandoned their call as disciples for another career and stopped following Christ and pursuing Him? What if they had said, everything that I needed, I got in those three years with Jesus, and I'm happy? What if they had not wanted, or waited rather, for the Holy Spirit and allowed Him to instruct them? to lead them? What if they hadn't waited for the day of Pentecost? When Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, got up and preached a sermon, and it changed 120 believers into 3,120 believers that very day. It's ironic to me that this reading comes up the Sunday right after confirmation. It's ironic to me because I felt that way every Confirmation Sunday. I have so much more I need to tell you, but you're not ready for this part yet. And I would say to every one of us as believers in Christ, myself included, there is so much more the Lord has for us to learn. So much more. But so often we think of confirmation as a graduation rather than a matriculation into the higher things of God. The deeper things. The greater meanings. The harder study. We call them the six chief parts in the Catechism because they're the rudimentary things of Christianity. It's not the things by which we stop and that's all we need. But so many of the Christians, good Christians, loving Christians, that's where they stop. It's been said, if you want to clear a church out, just confirm everybody. <laughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ lived roughly 33 years. He died in an agonizing six-hour horrific death that you can't really fit into your head. But prior to that, he had lived a life of holiness, the life we should have lived. Then he died sacrificially in our place in order to secure for us eternal life. That life eternal began for us at our baptism. The moment that we believed. It began for us then. And from the moment of faith, it never ends. For to be born once is to die twice. But to be born twice is to only die once. You must be born again. It's the same with our Christian education. His words to his disciples are as valid to them as they are this morning to each of us. I have so much more than just the rudiments. And it takes a lifetime to bear it. And beyond that, we have eternity. From the moment that He gives us the gift of faith, forever and ever we'll be uncovering the glories of the majesty of God. For as high as the stars are above the earth, so far are His ways above our ways, His thoughts above our thoughts. For from Him, and to Him, and through Him are all things. We'll never get to the bottom of God's glory and His majesty. We'll never get to the, to the end of God's blessing of heaven. 
He says, it's never even, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. It's never entered the mind of a human being. What glories wait for you who are in Christ Jesus. We'll never, ever get to the bottom of his unfailing, unfathomable love let alone who He is. We'll spend eternally, eternity marveling at God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and His great unending love for us. Jesus loves you. So often we feel as though we're done on the path of learning about Jesus. It's such a simple message. Jesus died in your place. He lived for you. The perfect life you couldn't live. And then He died a sacrificial death for you. And then He rose again victorious over death and hell. And you too will be risen on the last day. Very simple message. But Jesus starts by saying, I have so, so much more to tell you. The Holy Spirit is now guiding us into all truth. He said He would send Him and He would guide us. This is what the work of the church is. This is why we exist. To handle the things of the Spirit. To handle things that are not handled by secular man. Or to put into Lutheran terms, to execute the sacraments and to preach the word. Our job as believers is to be lifelong students of his word and his sacraments. To put ourselves in the way of his word. To learn, mark, and inwardly digest it. To receive all that He has for us. And He has so much to share with us. And He will as we continue to follow through with word and sacrament. To continue to hear Him. To continue to be lifted by Him. Forgiven by Him. To have Him reveal Himself and His truth wrapped up in these few words book we call the Bible. A word that is so clear. We know it from the time we're in Sunday school. A word that simply says, Jesus loves me, this I know. <coughs> For the Bible tells me so. But I have so much more. Keep up with those learnings. He will guide you into all truth.